This conference will now be recorded. Fantastic. Okay, so just to kick things off, again, I want to briefly introduce myself. I'm Pam Schilling, and I am the CEO of a company called Archer Career, and we focus on various aspects of career advancement, job searching, helping people navigate their careers. I and my team have been at this for quite a while. As it relates to this topic in particular, I and several others on our team at Archer Career have been consultants ourselves or been in corporate roles. We've had to both work through case interviews, we've delivered case interviews to our candidates. And in fact, we hired a couple of summer interns this summer and we put them through a case interview, of course. Why wouldn't we do that? So it's a topic that I thought a lot about over the years, largely because when I was a consultant and I worked for three different consulting firms, all based here in Chicago, where I am, I would sit in the interview room in a first round with a candidate and I had met this person on several occasions. I knew fundamentally that this person would make a great consultant but there was some kind of a stumbling block in that case interview. And I heard this from many of my colleagues and it was just frustrating and challenging. And as a result of that, being someone who likes to solve problems, I put a lot of attention into that. So it's something that I'm glad to share some of this for all of you as you are thinking about preparing um, and in many ways, you know, being a business person that, is solving problems every day, but trying to figure out how you navigate this at the interview stage. So just a couple of logistical things as we kick off. These webinars, we continue to do these um, throughout the summer. I'm really enjoying it. So again, thanks to all of you for participating. I'm glad we get to share this knowledge and um, some of our experiences in a very broad way. We have a few more webinars coming up into July. Feel free to register for any of those. Um, the next session is gonna talk a little bit more broadly about career setbacks. I think that there's a lot of individuals right now that are facing that and challenged and not sure about where to head, so we're gonna talk about that. And then picking back up on our summer consulting series, this topic, we're gonna talk a little bit about why you, which is both a combination of fit for consulting as well as thinking about strengths and background and how you might align to some of the hiring criteria. And then the first um, week of August, we're gonna talk about a few what I call super tips. And these are the kind of things that when I've debriefed with some of our clients, the things that they've done at various stages of the interview process that really have enabled them to both be confident and succeed in an extraordinary way. So we'll share a few of those tips. And as always, um, we like to have um, thank yous and other intriguing things that you all might enjoy. Um, in particular, our team has been very energetically working for the past year to bring about a new technology um, development of case preparation. And we're about seven or eight weeks away from launching that. So one of the things we wanna do is to get people using our software. And as a result of that, by attending the webinar, we're giving you an opportunity um, to have a one month subscription as a thank you. So please go out to the webinar or to the website and sign up for that. So archercareer.com job search software. And there's a little selection. Um, if you say that you attended this webinar, we'll put you um, on the mailing list and um, offer that opportunity to you. So it's very much related to this conversation tonight. The final thing, just in terms of our logistics, I continue to do some coaching where I'm donating that fee um, to a local business. Um, we just wrapped up uh, the local business that we've been working with to this point. And now that in Illinois, at least, 
phase four has opened up and restaurants are again beginning to have a little bit more flow through we've um, decided as a team to shift our donation for the rest of this summer so we'll be announcing that um, but if, if there's some type of a just a general coaching conversation that you want to have um, i've really enjoyed these i have a couple of them a week and i think they've been really mutually beneficial um, and again it also is a, a good cause to be able to direct um, your fee to a, an important organization in need. So enough of the marketing and PR. So I'm gonna jump right into our discussion. And as I do this, um, for those of you with us live, um, in the chat, I'd love to know one reason why you're thinking about case interviews and you know, perhaps you're looking at consulting roles, perhaps you're looking at corporate roles, perhaps you've started your preparation. So, you know, maybe just one quick thought about why it is that you came tonight to learn a little bit about case interviews, because I wanna, I want you all to see that from each other. And then I also would like to just have it as my context as I'm making comments this evening. So go ahead and, and please put your thought in the chat. Don't be shy. And as I um, see those thoughts coming in, a couple of things that I will share as we introduce this topic of the case interview. So one of the things that I think most of us know is that case interviews are very prominent in consulting, management consulting, all kinds of consulting. What we also know is that case interviews have become more prominent in other types of roles outside of consulting. I was in a number of corporate positions. I use case interviews. I have a client who just had a case interview interviewing for a marketing research position. Individuals going into data science have case interviews. People that are in computer science have case interviews. We might call it something different, but more or less it's a problem that you get a chance to solve live. This is not something new. That's the other thing that I wanna make sure that everybody is clear about. So my first consulting interview occurred in the fall of 1999. That yes, will date me, but I'm perfectly fine because it just shows that I have wisdom about this topic. The interview process for many of the consulting firms when it comes to cases, it quite honestly hasn't changed that much. The benefit to you is that this is not something where you need to go on an investigation of how to prepare for case interviews. Now, the delivery of the case interview has changed. The firms have modified a little bit of their approach. They've, you know, taken to, you know, some of them are doing mini cases, some of them are doing large cases, some of them have written cases. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Sometimes it's face-to-face, -face, you know, going into the next, I would say six to nine months, there's a strong probability that case interviews will be done virtually. And some companies have always done that. So the point is at the core, the case interview process is well, well-known, well-discussed. And then there's a few tweaks that maybe because of the current environment you'll have to think about. But what I have on the screen tells you a little bit about why in some ways it's easy to research the case interview because all these organizations that use case interviews, major employers, they provide guidance on their websites. They talk about how to prepare, they talk about what it is that they're looking for and their expectations. And I think that's good news as a candidate. This isn't something that you feel like you should try to create some treasure map that you have to go in search of. 
So think about some of those things, and I'm going to be talking about some of those tips and tricks as we go along tonight. But the bottom line is, this isn't anything that's new. So trying, one of my big points of emphasis is, you don't want to be surprised as a candidate. And many candidates do go into interviews and are surprised. And I've heard this at the undergraduate level, I've heard it at the MBA level, master's level, and experienced hires. There might be a few PhDs joining us. People seem to walk into the interview a lot less prepared. I don't want that to be you. I want you to be at the top of your game. When we think about the case interview, there are two things that when you get into the interview room that I think are very important equally important to your success. One is being prepared and knowing what to expect and, and the fundamentals of solving the problem. The second is to be confident. And I emphasize that because this is a process that is a little bit, for many, full of anxiety. You know, in the moment, you're asked about a problem and you have to solve it on the spot. And for the best of us, that is nerve wracking. Those who succeed in this process have developed a degree of confidence. That confidence comes from knowing that you've done what you can possibly do to be prepared. There are best practices around that preparation. There are multiple activities that allow you to do cross training, and then there's a progression of learning. And I see this time and time again with the individuals that I'm super lucky to work with that end up with the offers from not only the top consulting firms, but some super selective employers. There is a method, there's a methodical approach. And it begins with kind of understanding the business foundations, also then building the kind of skills that are necessary to solve a case. Those skills, it's kind of like cross training in athletics. You, you do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. If you're a marathon runner, you do some running, you do stretches, you do some sprints, you do long runs. There might be you know, weightlifting habits. It's the same sort of thing in case interviews because it's combining many different things, many different ways of thinking. The other thing that you have to start to be able to do is to connect ideas together because the case, sometimes it takes 25, 30 minutes to work on it. You learn something in the early step, you learn something a little bit further along, you have to be able to connect those dots. That is a very important skill for consultants. And then ultimately you gotta be ready for that interview. And one of the interesting things I think about that state of being interview ready is that the confidence comes from all this practice that you've done and, and all this practice might mean over a short period or a long period, depending on your circumstance. It also means being ready for the mental and physical fatigue of a case interview. A lot of times they're happening over a couple of hours, it's grueling, it's a bit like taking you know, a multifaceted exam, except that there's a person staring at you and you don't have a calculator or a computer often. So kind of having a mental state and some mental and physical conditioning has actually um, been one of the things that I've spent a lot more time researching and developing some approaches around. So keeping all those things in mind. Then what does it mean that you're trying to accomplish? So let me talk about the perspective of the assessment of a case. So as an interviewer, there are a few things that I'm looking for you to demonstrate in this interview. And, and let me caveat this by saying how um, critical my judgment and my level of expectation is somewhat going to depend on your background, what level you are. As an undergraduate student, there's certainly a lot less business experience. The academics, even if you've studied business, you know, you're learning it more from a theoretical standpoint that's very different than an MBA. Someone who's an experienced hire 
is going to have a different perspective. Um, and then someone who maybe doesn't have a business background, whether it's an undergrad, a master's, a PhD, you know, all of these things are taken into consideration. But at the fundamental level, you are being asked to solve problems, business problems. And it could be, you know, all kinds of things that the consultants are working on or representative of what they're working on. But in that interview, you have to show kind of these things or these are the things that an interviewer is looking at. So one is your communication approach. And one of the things I was talking to a friend of mine last week who um, used to work for McKinsey and we were discussing kind of some of these case, um, case foundations and the things that make people stand out. And one of the things that he said that just resonated with me was the communication. And a lot of times in the case interview, you have to communicate to the interviewer what's in your head. What are you thinking? In our everyday work, we don't typically do that. And that's one of the, the things that I think is kind of hard in this process is that you have to take a little bit of um, risk in your communication. And then you also have to communicate in a very thoughtful and logical way. Along this journey, you're going to be doing some type of analytics, and the interviewer is going to look at your ability to analyze information. And that is both quantitatively by way of calculation, and then on top of it, qualitatively, where maybe you're looking at pros and cons, maybe you're thinking about trade offs. There are a lot of analytics that don't involve numbers, and that's very important. An additional element that goes on in a case is your ability to prioritize. And, and this may be one of the biggest challenges that people face. Again, you maybe have 25, 30 minutes to solve a pretty open-ended business issue. And you have to pick and choose because in that amount of time, you're not gonna be able to solve every single issue. So, you know, if I have, for example, a case that, you know, maybe I have a shoe company and they have developed a really strong business, it's regional, they want to think about their growth strategy. How would they do that? I mean, that's a really big question. And what you have to be able to do in the interview is to prioritize a couple of things that matter the most that are going to help them decide how they might grow. So that aspect is important. And then the other two points that I think kind of work together in balance. So on the one hand, you wanna think creatively because that's what many consultants are hired to do, to take the things that haven't worked in the past and figure out new ways or to drive innovation uh, for an organization or to make things better, that's creativity. But then on the flip side, you want to be a little bit pragmatic because not all solutions are feasible. And being able to explain that is really important. So in the shoe company that I just mentioned, you know, maybe one of your ideas is to develop uh, sales channels internationally. You know, they're regionally, maybe they're on the West Coast of the US, and it's like, wow, there's this huge, you know, global market. Well, is that a, a pragmatic idea? I mean, a company who's never done business internationally, there's a lot of problems. So being able to talk through that just shows this rounded thinking that you have. The interviewer is looking for you to be able to balance all these things. And the you know key to this is you're likely working on a case that's some type of a real business problem. It might even be a client project that the consultant has worked on or is presently working on. Sometimes there's not exactly a right answer to the case. You know, there might be an end destination that thematically the consultant wants you to get to, but you know, many problems have multiple solutions and scenarios at the end. And the, the real highlight is how do you structure getting from point A to point Z? That is very, very important because consulting is a job that is very structured. 
because otherwise, again, it would be very difficult to work through a particular client matter. And one thing that I often stress, you know, I see this a lot um, when I'm at some of the business schools where I where I do work um, when I'm there on site, which uh, isn't quite happening these days. I will sit in the lounge or the student, you know, the, the cafeteria or cafe, and I'll hear students work on cases, and I'll see people get really excited about getting the answer to the case. And I appreciate that because I think we all enjoy that. But, you know, real business problems don't exactly have answers. And what I think tends to work a little bit better as a mindset is thinking about the journey. Did you get from the beginning to the end in a really um, kind of concise way? Did you focus on the most important issues? Did you get at some of the really interesting insights of the case? It's not just about the answer, because a lot of the cases that are given, especially in first rounds, they're not terribly complex. They're certainly not as complex as some of the things that you know you might work on in your day-to-day -day job. But how you get there and, and some, again, those aspects of creativity, that's really what matters. So, I mean, that's a little bit of my philosophy when it comes to kind of how as an interviewer, we're judging the case interview as, as a candidate. And then for you, you're trying to present a few different things. So when you take um, stock of what it is that you're trying to demonstrate to the interviewer, there's some of those things that I just talked about that are being assessed, but there's also some other things that you're trying to present. So on the front end of this, there are two pieces that come into play. One happens to be the theoretical background of business. And again, depending on who you are, what type of a candidate you are, that theoretical background, you may have to know more versus less. Again, as an undergraduate student, the expectation might be a little bit less. As an MBA, you might be expected to know a little bit more. Um, as an experienced professional, it, it just depends. Depends a little bit on what role that you're interviewing for. But um, theory is really important, and I'm going to speak to that in a couple of slides. The other thing that is tricky is this idea of real world knowledge. The case wants you to bring forth both experience that you've had and observations that you make about the world because consultants are very insightful people in general. They tend to have good perspectives and that's important. Um, but a lot of times, our real world knowledge can overhang how we naturally solve a case. And if you have too much real world knowledge, you might be describing the problem based on what you've done in the past, as opposed to thinking about that problem in the moment. And those of you that are more experienced hires, I'm gonna use the abbreviation EH. This is, um, again, kind of a tricky area. Um, and I know I at one point was interviewing with a, a consulting firm and I made that mistake. I had a case, it was exactly like one of my prior client problems and essentially the approach that I mapped out when I was solving the case was just like my prior client. And I could, I could see that it wasn't going well because when I started getting questions, the interviewer wanted me, I think, to be more organic. Um, so that's just something to balance. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if you get cases and they happen to deal with, you know, say an international market and um, you've traveled in that area and you can say, you know, here's what I think would be sensible. And then, oh, by the way, when I observed some of these things during my travels, I would think this, this is the basis for some of my assumptions. That makes a lot of sense. So those things come together and then you've got, again, those analytics, that pragmatism, the creativity. What you're trying to show as you work a case 
is that you can link those things together. And then when you're working the case in the room, the interviewer, I'm looking at you as someone I might put on one of my projects. And this is kind of an interesting assessment, I think, of the case interview. I'm gonna hire you. And when I hire you, you're gonna do this kind of work. And so when you can approach the interview with this like reality, which means you're sitting there together, of course, right now, you might be doing this virtually if you're interviewing in the next six months, but you're really talking to the person and you're placing yourself in that case as if you are solving it for that client. And that has a transformative aspect where it doesn't look like you're taking an exam. It doesn't look like a Q&A. It looks like you and a colleague who happens to be the interviewer are working through this problem and your colleague is sharing the information that they know. And that's a good thing. And by the way, your interviewer wants you to succeed in this case, because if you succeed and you're a bright person who has the chops to do the consulting job, then the consulting firm wins. That person might win because they get a chance to work with you. So this reality is key. Um, I mentioned the structure before and kind of having a methodical approach to the problem. And then something additional that you're gonna be demonstrating is logic. And logic in this circumstance means that when you speak about your thinking, you make assumptions, you offer a perspective or a point of view, you then explain why. And that is something that's very, very important because consulting, especially management consulting, strategy consulting, these are places where a lot of assumptions are being made. And so you have to have good rationale. Um, and for those of you that are curious about this topic, there's a really great book and I'm putting it in the chat. It's called The Pyramid Principle. I believe it's written by some former McKinsey consultants. It's a wonderful explanation of the kind of logic that is necessary for this type of thinking. It's beneficial both for cases as well as overall communication. Um, and of course, if you can find it used, I would highly recommend that. So logic and reasoning. Um, and then as I said before, that idea of confidence being able to put your point of view, being able to demonstrate some risk in your thinking. And another place where you can demonstrate confidence is when you get pushback or you get challenged by your interviewer. So what that might look like is, let's say that we're back on our shoe case and you propose an idea that maybe the shoe company should create an online presence. And the interviewer, I might say this to you, well, gosh, it feels to me like shoes are kind of hard to sell online. Don't you have to try them on? How would you possibly get people to buy shoes online? It might jar you if you get that pushback. It might come across that the interviewer thinks your idea is not a good idea. It doesn't have merit, it won't work. What the interviewer is really looking for is for you to say, well, you know, I think that that would be a challenge and that is probably a risk in this strategy. But here's a couple of thoughts that I have about how to do that. And then you would explain. So that is how confidence gets demonstrated. In the case interview, the things that you demonstrate are a precursor to how you will do the job. That in a consulting job is super critical because the client is going to do all these same things. You know, I have had clients who have said to me, you know, Pam, I read through this analysis, I just don't get it. 
I think your assumptions, they're wildly optimistic. Or I don't, I don't know that you've fully taken into consideration these aspects of our business. You know, and you have to be able to appreciate the client's perspective, but then stand your ground. And that has to be shown that you at least have the propensity to do that in the case interview. Um, on the flip side, you can't have arrogance and say, well, I, you know, of course my answer's right. Um, sometimes you learn new pieces of information as the case goes along, and you have to confidently say, now that I have this piece of information, it sheds a little bit different light on my thinking. And that changes my direction. That's also confidence. So I emphasize those things because the case interview, we don't often call it a stress interview, but in fact, it is a stressful circumstance because the job itself has a lot of stress, a lot of things at stake with it. And so we're trying to test a lot of those behaviors. So the case has elements of both the problem solving, but also kind of the behavioral characteristics of individuals who succeed in consulting. Um, and I, I see a couple questions in the chat. I will come back to those. So what does this mean in terms of your skill building? And some of it is what are you trying to get to? And then we're gonna talk a little bit about how we get there. When I think about building skills for cases, there's a few things that I try to aim for. So one is your ability to structure the problem and prioritize the issues. The other is what kind of questions that you ask because consulting requires you to be good at asking questions. This is how you get data. This is how you get information. You have to ask the right kinds of questions, not get in the weeds so much because again, you only have so much time. Also, the case interview, I, I use this um, kind of analogy. It, it's a little bit like trying to find a, a golden nugget. There's often in a case kind of this aha or this, you know, oh my gosh, that factor, that piece of information, that's really critical to thinking about this problem. That's known as the interview insight. And even simple cases might have a really intriguing insight. The difference between candidate A and candidate B, both might get to the answer more or less, but one might illuminate that insight a little bit better than the others. And when you do that, that's gonna enable you to stand out. On top of it, you're getting all this different information and your ability to connect point A to point G and see how those two things come together. You know, I've mentioned the analytics a couple of times. You, you'll do, as I said, qualitative and quantitative analytics. You will also, in many cases, do reviews of charts, different types of charts, data visualizations. Um, and from the analytics, then you need to synthesize it. And what does it mean in the context of the overall case question? Then getting through that originality, creativity, and how does the overall approach kind of come across? And one of the things that we look for today when we're helping candidates prepare for case interviews and we're doing mock interviews is we're trying to help you get out of the mechanics and make that case interview much more conversational. Again, like you're working on a real problem. So in general, just as a high level, um, and please remember, I will post these slides um, along with the video on the website, but kind of working through a case. I mean, there's not a complicated flowchart, but if you're just trying to get a feel, kind of beginning to end of how the case works, you start out with a prompt. You know, there's a startup, fast-growing athletic shoe company. 
based in California. They've done really well. They've, you know, kind of regionally had a lot of success. Now they want to grow. How might they do that? That's a case prompt. Um, another case prompt could be uh, your client has just acquired one of their biggest competitors. The integration is not well formulated. You know, what would be the approach that you think they ought to use? Um, another case could be uh, you are the advisor to the CEO of a major brick and mortar retailer. They've gotten themselves into a significant amount of financial leverage. They're trying to determine some plans to move forward. You know, what would your advice be, right? All kinds of problems like this. Um, I've even seen problems that, you know, you're advising the dean of the business school or the college that you're a part of. It's, they're in this position new. What would be the four priorities that you would give them, right? So case prompts can be, you know, vast, vast, many, many choices. Um, what we try to do then is use hypotheses to help us narrow our thinking, to have some ideas at the start, to, again, not try to think about a million things, to focus our attention, and then you put the structure together, which is essentially the collection of analysis that you're going to do to try to evaluate this business issue. Then you're going to do the analysis, qualitative, quantitative, chart reviews. From that analysis, you're going to check in, revise your hypotheses, and then eventually they turn into conclusions. And then with those conclusions, you might have formulated some recommendations. Just kind of depends on the nature of the case. So all this happens in, again, about 25 or 30 minutes. It's fast. It seems like a bit um, a bit daunting to do in that short period of time, but that's the expectation. Um, and by the way, some case interviews are even smaller in scope. It's more like a scenario. You know, you are given um, maybe a, a short issue. You know, we're working with the division of our company. They're thinking a little bit about some options to grow revenue. You know, they're looking for you. You know, how might you think about that? What ideas would you have? What data would you want to collect? You know, and maybe in that shorter scenario, you only talk for 15 minutes. You wouldn't necessarily go through this entire case flow. So recognize that there's a range of ways that cases might appear. When we think then about case interviews, there is a tremendous amount of discussion about frameworks. And for any of you that have done some investigation of cases already, you might have seen this information, have um, heard that one of the things that you're supposed to do to help with your case structure is to prepare a framework. So we take a little bit of a balanced philosophy about frameworks. So the idea is you have to have a reasonable view of, of business acumen. Because at the core of a case in this area, um, management consulting, strategy consulting, operations consulting, you know, these, these are business cases. So you have to have a decent background in some business acumen. Um, for those of you that are not MBAs, you're certainly not going to have that extent, but it doesn't hurt to get a pinch of business knowledge. But the way that you can kind of think about this, a lot of business problems focus on profitability. And at the heart of business cases, case interviews, a lot of times understanding profitability and the drivers behind profitability can make a big difference. 
And that can be a valuable way to think about a lot of case issues. But there are other areas, other frameworks, other areas of business acumen that can be useful. So we have kind of organized the business problems into seven different categories. So in addition to profitability, you have something called a market study. Um, this is when a business wants to enter a new market. They want to grow revenue, gain market share, deal with a competitor. Typically, you can, you can a little bit anchor to an industry analysis for that, which is based on Michael Porter's Five Forces. That is a widely publicized um, business framework. You can find it in Harvard Business Review. You can find it online. You, can, you don't necessarily need a textbook. That's very broad. Um, there's also a number of cases that involve mergers and acquisitions or joint ventures. Typically, the areas that get probed are the synergies, which is a quantitative way. If you take company number A or letter A and you take company letter B and you combine them, one plus one ought to equal three in terms of revenue. And then one plus one ought to equal 0.75 in terms of the costs. That's essentially synergies. Then you also have a number of investment decisions. You know, should we go into this new business? Should we invest in this product? That typically involves some type of financial evaluation. We use things like net present value, payback, return on investment, maybe evaluation. You know, those are a bit technical, um, but having a, a bit of a foundation can be valuable. Another area is what's known as an internal evaluation. Sometimes that's wrapped around marketing. Also different types of operations, the organization, leadership, you know, how the business runs. And so having a, a bit of an understanding of the four Ps framework can be good. Um, a sixth area is a little bit of a unique area, but some consulting firms do a lot of work in these areas. So private equity, venture capital, startups, they often have unique considerations. Um, Bain and Company is actually a firm that tends to have a lot of emphasis in private equity because many of their clients are private equity backed. Um, and then there's, a, I think, a growing um, number of organizations that the private equity firm will hire the consultants. So thinking about those. And then the seventh area is this grouping of kind of non-private sector, non-profit generating businesses, nonprofits, NGOs, public sector organizations. They often have unique considerations they have board and governance challenges, they have mission-driven businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're thinking about business frameworks, a lot of times the profit framework is very popular, and then there's also something called the three Cs that is a great um, way to begin to think about a case. And three Cs is, company, competitor, and uh, the other aspect of it is customers. So it's a nice way to kind of think about cases. What I think most seasoned consultants will say is you start with those frameworks and then you kind of evolve them to be a little bit more organic. Now, some of you, and I, I had this in the registrations for tonight's webinar, you know, one of the questions is, how do I transition into consulting? I may be coming from, you know, the field of science. I may be coming from a technology background. I may be coming from teaching. Um, I've seen people that are medical doctors go into um, consulting lawyers. This depth of business acumen just might not be a part of your background. So this can serve as a little bit of a quick MBA, if you will. 
There are lots of articles online. The Harvard Business Review often talks about these. Um, there's a really cool website that I'll link to when I post the video. It's called quickmba.com. It just has some really nice kind of highlights. Um, there's a book that I'll also link to, and I always forget the exact title. It's either 20 MBA models or 25 MBA models. I know I should have that detail, but you know, it's Wednesday night and seven o'clock, so my brain um, skips the exact number. But it's a fantastic book that kind of brings together a lot of these aspects. And that will form the basis for some of your frameworks, okay? Um, and then the final thing that I'll mention here, that's maybe a little less of a framework, but there are some tips and tricks. So as part of the analytics of cases, thinking about fast math, which is doing math quickly, there are shortcuts, um, thinking about how to do word problems. I mean, these are actually kind of the way that you learned math maybe in fifth or sixth grade. Um, if you went to school in the US um, or first grade, if you were accelerated. And then on top of that, there are approaches for something we call market sizing, which is how much of something is sold, you know, how many uh, athletic shoes are sold in the US every year or in the UK every year. Um, that has some uh, particular, if you will, frameworks. I'm going to use that term liberally. And then even just estimating, um, there are some approaches to being able to do that. So, you know, if you take kind of this page, the, the idea is that it targets some of the thinking and then you apply some of these frameworks and business acumen to the various cases that you all are solving. Um, and again, I'm, I'm hoping when I post this, I have a number of resources that are both um, easy, not overwhelming, um, not expensive. Um, and certainly if you're an MBA student, you're going to get a lot of this business acumen in the MBA program if you, if you did not come from an undergrad business education. The, the thing I always remind the MBAs though, you're going to be interviewing in January for internship interviews. You will probably have four to five MBA level courses done by that time. It was really only one quarter or one semester, depending on what program you're in. Um, now, fortunately, a lot of the MBA programs have created kind of mini courses and summer programs. So that works to your benefit. But this is the kind of thing that either if you're a current student at the undergrad, master's, MBA, PhD level, to, to try to build this business acumen um, pre-program, pre-recruiting cycle. Um, and then if you're someone who's an experienced hire, if it isn't sort of the field that you've worked in, again, the references. And then for those that are experienced hires but have an MBA, sometimes having a refresher of these things is quite nice. And I'm happy to talk about um, the frameworks a little bit more as we go along. So just a couple more comments and then I'll open up for, for questions. In the case styles of delivery, not every case comes at you in the same way. So the way that I equate to this, um, I, I like to use sports analogies. I apologize if you're not a sports fan, but it kind of works in, in my head. In um, Major League Baseball, which my father tells me he misses greatly, um, you have a pitcher and a pitcher throws different types of pitches. They have a curveball, they have a fastball, they have a slider. Um, some have a forkball that they throw inside, outside, high, low. They have, they have all these, you know, it's a pitch, but they come at the batter in different ways and the ball behaves in different ways. That's a little bit like how I think and I, how I I advise people to do research around cases. So some cases are what we call self-directed, where you're given the prompt and you have to take over the solving of the case and you drive the beginning to end and you're speaking to your interviewer and you're asking for information 
you're synthesizing things, you're giving them conclusions, they might be asking you questions, but it's really you working through that journey of the case. On the other hand, there's a case that we describe as interviewer-led, which means I, as the interviewer, I'm kind of prompting you along the way. And I, I ask you to look at an area and to think about that, and you kind of conclude that area. Then I ask you for another area. That, that makes me, the interviewer, a little bit more in charge. A third type of case we call a written case. This is usually very clear. Oftentimes, you're given the case in advance of your interview. It could be a week. It could be three days. It could be three hours. It just depends on the approach of the firm. You're usually given multiple pages. Sometimes you're given charts and data. You have to synthesize it. You might have to write things down. You might be given a computer. And then when you actually have your interview, you tend to summarize or walk through, and then the interviewer or interviewers, plural, ask you questions. Um, so if a company is using that style, that's usually made very clear. Um, I just had a client that went through a process. I think they had four days to prepare the case. They had to prepare PowerPoint slides. They had to send it by 8 a.m. the morning of their interview. And then during their interview, which was one hour, they had to give a 45 minute presentation and then there was 15 minutes for Q&A. That's a written interview. And this was not a consulting position, by the way. So these types of things go on. Um, and, and in some ways, the written case, um, I see it definitely with some consulting firms. Um, they do change their process a little bit from year to year. Um, but I see it a lot in the corporate environment. A team case is as it is described. You're given the business problem, you work with colleagues. It kind of works like a written case, but you're working with more than one person. That has some unique attributes because you have to show good teamwork, but you also have to show that your point of view and insight about the case is driving the case. Um, and then the final, um, and I mentioned this a little bit um, previously, there's something that's more like a mini case or a scenario. It's probably just um, some quick discussion back and forth between you and the interviewer. You don't typically do a lot of note taking. Um, and it probably is gonna happen over maybe five or 10 minutes just to see how you think about a problem, okay? How do you learn about this? Well. There's some empirical data. So we know that certain types of firms have certain patterns. You know, the self-directed case for consulting firms is the most common. Um, by the way, I could have a lot more firms listed there. Um, that is definitely what more often than not is used by consulting firms. The interviewer-led case, uh, McKinsey is one of the companies that most typically uses that. And then the written case, uh, and it depends a little bit here on geography sometimes. Um, Bain and BCG both have used written cases in some form or fashion. Um, some students have had it, some do not. It, it, it just depends a little bit on the offices. Um, the U.S. is also a little bit different than some of the international locations, so keep that in mind. Um, firms like Deloitte and Kearney have used team cases. And then mini cases and scenarios more often than not are used in the corporate setting, um, but they may also use other types of cases. One of the things that I often like to emphasize, when you're interviewing for corporate roles, in certain types of jobs, strategy, product management, business operations, et cetera, et cetera, some of the people interviewing you used to work for consulting firms. And so what that means is the style of interviewing that you may get is representative of that person's history. Um, I had a, a colleague of mine who interviewed at a tech company out on the West Coast. The person they were interviewing with used to work for the Boston Consulting Group. 
Um, I had a, another student that I was speaking to that was interviewing for an online um, kind of e-commerce retailer. The people they were interviewing with all came from Bain. So this is where one of the things I often suggest to people if you're not interviewing for a consulting job is to look at the professional history of the individuals that you're interviewing with. And that will tell you a little bit about the approach that they might be using. Um, and one last commentary about this, cases are just not in um, corporate roles and consulting. Um, we did some case preparation recently with an individual interviewing for investment banking positions because in addition to the technical job, there was some market sizing and valuation, which are areas that overlap between consulting and investment banking. Um, if you uh, find yourself, you know, maybe interviewing for private equity or venture capital, those jobs have some common traits with investment banking. And so even those type of roles might have some form of case attached to them. And in um, sort of wrapping this conversation up, I wanna talk a little bit about practice. And first is approach, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about resources. So the best approach for practice is to do some drills, which are isolated areas of case practice. Could be market sizing, could be brainstorming, could be structuring, could be analytics, could be reviewing certain industries. I'm gonna give you guys a list of those. Then we practice, and by this practice, I mean two people together. Two people, okay? Draw a couple of people. This is one person, it's you, and it's more solo. And there's plenty of practice that you can do without a partner. Now, eventually you do have to practice cases with a partner because most cases you're going to be working with an interviewer on the case. So drills are you on your own, practice is often with a partner. When you get your feedback, from your practice. Studying this feedback is crucial. And learning about the gaps. Where are you less strong? Where are you stronger? And what you really want to do is drill further on the gaps. So as an example, I have a, a client who's been preparing for consulting interviews. Um, she has one scheduled upcoming in August. And at some point a few months back when she was practicing with a partner, she kept getting some commentary about the analytics part, that it was she was being almost too methodical, um, not quick enough. And she would have a couple of cases where she just got the math wrong. And what we talked about, and when we looked at the feedback, what was happening is it had to do with kind of the verbal nature of the analytics. So the, the math part of the case was being delivered verbally. And in her practice, she was practicing math operations, which is, you know, five plus 10, 20 plus 50. And it was just numbers on a page. Um, and that was really good to help with math operations and quickness. But when the math was put in context, it, it was somehow distracting and creating um, stress that was affecting how she did analytics in a case. And so then what she did was some particular drills on math problems, kind of word problems, and then went back, did some more practice, and then that issue corrected itself. And not only did she get better in terms of accuracy, she got better at speed. So this is a feedback loop that's really important in your practice. And the more that you can do that, the better off. Um, and if you have a week of time, you do this in context. If you have three months of time, you do this you know, over that, over that timeline. All right, so the last few resources then for case practice. You know, If you're just beginning, 
if you're starting to think about, you know, what can I do to pick up? These are some of the things that I think work really great. So one, as I mentioned previously, go out to the consulting firms and every one of them has a careers page. The larger firms have really fantastic information. They'll have videos, they'll have example cases, they'll have suggestions. That is a wonderful starting ground for your case practice. The other area, and I'm thinking about things that are free, go out to YouTube. You can type in case interview, case interview demo. There's great information out there. And how do you validate it? Well, look at the number of views and you'll start to see that um, I think the, the crowd um, uh, sort of recognition of the good, the good cases, the good interview tips um, comes through pretty clearly. Um, if you are so inclined, there are several expert case books that are out there. I'm gonna give you a list when um, I post all this information on my website. You can find these on um, your favorite, you know, online book buying. The uh, great thing is that they're good starting ground. They're written by people that have a lot of expertise. Um, I think they're good to start, but then, you know, nothing um, works better than practice. The other thing that I encourage for case preparation is industry research. I know even in my own experience, before business school, I worked in one industry. I worked in the telecommunications industry. I knew it inside and out. I was not as familiar with other industries. And most of the time in my cases, I handled that well. Um, when I did recruiting as an MBA student, I really only had one bad interview. I still remember the case. It was a pharmaceutical case and when I thought about it after the fact, I probably had not done as much work kind of reviewing the core aspects of the pharmaceutical industry. And then I got a really weird pricing case about um, you know, taking a drug into the market and I just kind of froze. So industry research helps. Um, you pick you know, 10 or 12 industries, do some reading, you can find that information online. If you happen to be a student, um, many of the libraries, um, even as an alumni, you can get access to things like Hoover's, um, Ebus World, but even the Wall Street Journal has great information um, and even just doing Google searches, you can find things. In addition, valuable things to put in your toolkit, Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, FT, they have very inexpensive subscriptions. Kind of being abreast of business issues is important. Further up the ladder, as you get, you know, kind of more into drilling, there are some online prep tools. Um, do some Google searches for them. And there's lots of resources, lots of videos. Some of them are free. Some of them have a paid subscription, you know, be choosy. Um, some of the schools, again, if you're a student, um, potentially even alumni may give you access to that. Um, and then also there are consulting club casebooks. And what I have discovered is that those are often published. Um, after a number of years. So if you're at a particular school that has a consulting club, particularly the larger schools, they'll have case books. But even if you're not, if you go online and you type in you know, the name of one of the top 10 MBA programs, uh, there happen to be websites out there that will collect kind of historical case books. They're great. Business cases don't change that much. Um, sometimes there's a small fee, sometimes there's a charge you know, use your financial resources wildly, you know, or wisely, I should say. And um, they're nice because they also have other tips and tricks in them that can be valuable for your preparation. Okay, so that's a little bit of a, of a kind of fast and furious run through. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause um, take a look at the chat and see if there's any questions that you guys have. 
Um, but then also, you know, feel free to take yourself off mute. And I'm happy to elaborate on anything further about what I've talked about, any particular questions that you might have. Um, so I'm gonna address one of the questions in the chat already. If you guys have other questions, pop them in there. Um, and then I'll, I'll pause as well um, for questions live. So the, the current question um, is, is related more, I think, to the, the job itself. You know, how often would a recommendation be questioned by the client? Um, you know, I would assume that you would normally engage them for clarification, all that good stuff. Um, you know, always clients ask good questions, tough questions. I think some clients um, have doubt about the work of consultants. I think some clients really want to know. Um, so you, you're not going to be questioned, let's say, in a steering committee meeting. If you are, that might mean you haven't done your job. Uh, but a lot of times when you've come up with something, you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one session with your key stakeholders, and that's where you might get a lot of questions. Um, but it's also true that sometimes you have an executive on your steering committee that isn't as close to the, the details of the project, and you present something and they, you know, they're going to ask questions for it in an open forum. That's normal. Um, as long as you've got trust built up, it won't derail things. But this is one of the reasons why the case interview tests if you have um, kind of the ability to stand up to that pushback. Okay. All right. Other questions that you all might have. Nothing. Does that mean that this was perfectly clear or is it perfectly overwhelming? So I'm just uh, maybe to, to help me um, think about a couple of other things that I might add for you're thinking right now, what are some of the things that maybe um, worry you about the case interview? And you guys can add that to the chat. I've got a couple of other questions. Um, one of them is, and, and thank you, Lester, for this question. You know, there are many expensive case prep programs. Do you think they're worth it? Can we get by with stealth study and practicing? I'm gonna be as objective about this as I possibly can. So my firm provides one of those expensive case prep programs. So I'm gonna tell you guys that right up, you know, and I am not here to market this. I think for some people, it is worth it. I know that the range of some of these programs, it can be a couple hundred dollars to, I've seen a program out there that's something close to $10,000. So what I would say to you, to all of you, um, and this you know, is just kind of the way that I handle these types of decisions, this is an investment and you have to have a really good business case for your investment. The entry level consulting job in the US for an MBA, uh, which includes advanced degrees, masters, PhDs, I think the starting salaries this past year were something north of $160,000, $165,000. I think the undergrad, I don't know, it's like 80, 80 ish, if I remember correctly. You know, one might say that spending $2,000 justifies that. Um, but I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I have worked with plenty of individuals that I've met at a workshop that the schools hired me to do. Um, maybe I've had a, you know, 15, 20 minute coaching conversation with them a couple of times, um, and they land an offer at, you know, one of the top firms. I've also worked with people in our 
kind of high touch, highly guided, highly structured coaching programs. So what is the difference? What are the questions you should ask yourself? Number one, I think you need to ask yourself about your degree of discipline. Number two, you need to ask yourself what it is that you're looking for. Are you looking for someone to drill you? And do you need a recurrence of having a partner accessible to you that you can't get in other ways? Um, and I think also it depends a little bit on your background. I mean, I can tell you that overwhelmingly some of the people that, that we end up working with in some of our programs, there's a profile. Um, it's generally individuals who come from STEM backgrounds, technology, sciences, um, people who do not have business backgrounds. So people who've worked in nonprofits um, and not on the business side of the nonprofit, people who've worked in teaching, uh, people who've worked in the law, um, I think also people that are more junior in their careers that maybe feel like they just need a, a bit more elevation of perspective. Um, and then I've also, I also work with a lot of experienced candidates that are trying to make, uh, sort of take their background and bridge it. So sometimes um, your characteristics of your background warrant those programs. I, I, I do not always take clients and some people have come to me and said, I'd really like to be in one of your programs. And I've kind of looked at them and said, I don't really know that you need it. You know, so my, my advice to you is do your research, think about what you're looking for, think about the business case, and then ask yourself, what have you done in the past that required extraordinary amounts of discipline in a very unstructured environment because the case um, the case prep there's kind of a roadmap but not exactly but you got to do a lot of things can you do it on your own or do you need a partner you know those are some of my thoughts um, another question about how to case interview types differ across practice groups within a firm? A, a great question as well. It depends a little bit on the firm. From what I've seen, and I try to debrief with a lot of our clients and the students that I get to know after the interview season. As an example, and, and this is a, I think a fair assessment, and if you find differences you know, please understand that there are always unique differences. But I think in general, McKinsey interviews pretty consistently, regardless of the role, regardless of the practice, regardless of the industry group, other than in some really specialized areas, like they have some expert roles, um, you know, the firm is getting into more of the data science that may have more technical aspects. Um, I think BCG is somewhat similar to that. Um, the one, you know, difference might be when they're using a written case, they have a problem solving test that they use that might differ by office and practice. Um, you get into other firms. I mean, I had a client, a couple of clients recently that interviewed with Oliver Wyman. Their processes were quite different depending on the practice, number of rounds, types of cases, those sorts of things. Thus, it means that you wanna do a little bit of research and as you get into the interview process, the firm, the HR, you know, recruiting coordinator that you're working with, usually they'll share that with you. The final thing I would say about the interview types is that at the core, it's all the same. There's just a few um, nuances, you know, with an interviewer led versus 
an interviewee or self-directed. You know, obviously, if you're doing a team case, you know, there's some dynamics. A written case is actually very similar to an a self-directed case. It's just in writing. So, you know, synthesis of all of that is know the firm, talk to people if you can who have recently interviewed in that firm or in that practice and if all else fails you know ask the recruiter you know they want you to be as prepared as possible okay um, i know for a fact um, a, a number of the the students that i was working with last summer were interviewing with like the m a group of one of the firms it might have been ey parthenon if I remember right. And they were very clear about the fact that their cases were going to be M&A focused. And in fact, they did a case workshop. The firm did that. So they're not trying to trick you. I, I don't think, I think that's a fair statement. I don't think these consulting firms are trying to trick you about the style. Um, what they want is for you to be kind of fundamentally prepared and um, you know, being able to work within the the general context. And if they have something really specific, they're going to tell you. I think that's probably the, the highlight of all of that. Um, another question um, that I just got, you know, is the bar for getting into boutique firms significantly lower? I'm going to go with no. And I think I will say it this way. So here's the difference between boutiques and large firms. Um, one is the number of people they're hiring. Uh, McKinsey at a, at, at a Harvard Business School, I mean, I think they hire 50, 60, 70 plus people every year. Um, at Booth, um, it's like 35. At Kellogg, it's probably 35, 40. So that's a large number of people. Um, a boutique, depending on the boutique, they might be hiring two people, not for the office, for the entire firm, depending on how boutique it is. And on top of it, some boutiques have just a hiring strategy to really rigorously assess candidates. Um, if And depending on what you, um, you know, Lester, you've asked that question, depending on what you consider a boutique, um, there is a boutique consulting firm called Bridgespan. They, ha I think it's one of the most difficult consulting firms to get into. They are, many of those individuals are ex-Spain or BCG, they're looking for people who have experience in nonprofits, mission-led businesses, really deep academic backgrounds. It's very, very difficult um, to get an offer from them. So, you know, I think if, if you're not interviewing at a large firm, if you're interviewing at a boutique, you know, really understand their background, um, think about their hiring process and, you know, they may be, what, what it sometimes might be is that they're looking for different attributes. So the case might be 25% of their decision. You have to do well, but the other 75% might be fit with the firm. You know, and so as a candidate, sometimes that can seem daunting. I mean, I can tell you, I went to a boutique at a business school my second round had four back-to-back -back interviews. Uh, that was hard. <laughs> and then when I joined them and I was now on the hiring side, I know that we were tough on candidates um, and, and fit was a big consideration. So it's a fair, you know, it's a fair question. Um, and I do think that it's something that in the consulting industry, we rank the firms. If you go out to whatever your favorite list is, and sometimes that's a perception. Um, I, I tend to kind of put that in context, probably just because of some of the experience that I've had. Um, 
Another question, you know, how hard is it to get a phone interview? I think if we exclude the present environment, you know, let's just step away for a moment. I mean, right now it's hard. Uh, most of the consulting firms are doing very little interviewing. That's just the truth. Um, it, it depends, depends on the office, depends on the practice. There is some, but this is really hard. So exclude this extraordinary environment. I would say it this way. If you have fantastic credentials and you have a well-developed resume, um, and by the way, that's one of my upcoming webinars. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the considerations to grant you a first round interview. I, I think on the whole, some of the firms are very generous because they have large recruiting teams. They have a lot of resources. Um, but then I know people that have worked diligently for months and just haven't been able to get that first phone interview. So then often, you know, there might be something holding you back. So how hard is it? Uh, you know, it's really hard. It's, it's difficult. I mean, there's fantastic candidates out there. And, you know, if, if you present yourself and you have had some conversations you might have an advocate, you get a referral, you have a resume that shows you've got consulting skills, you've done work that demonstrates impact, um, and you have experience that can be relevant to what a client needs, you know, you increase your odds quite a bit. But I, you know, I take an approach and anybody who's worked with me would know this, I tend to leave no stone unturned. I mean, I've, I've had a chance to work with really fantastically credentialed people um, who've not gotten interviews because something didn't click in their candidacy. Um, or I've had people who've, you know, struggled for many months come to me and we try to, you know, fix some of those issues. So it, it, can, be, it can be really challenging um, but again, use some of the resources at your disposal. Look at the firm's websites, their career pages, again, are very transparent about the types of things that they're looking for. Um, but just assume that it's difficult. I mean, I think that there's some statistic out there that says McKinsey hires like 2% of all applicants. It's, it's a tiny number. Of course, they get a lot of applicants, so keep that in mind, okay? Other questions? Looking at my list of anything that else was submitted. All right. Any other questions that you guys have? If not, I'll make a couple of closing comments. All right. Um, okay, so a, a good question about getting referrals. You know, so you all, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, you know, step back a little bit, kind of to the 20, 30,000 foot level by the way, the case interview is just one part of this process. Um, the webinar I did a couple weeks ago kind of mapped out the bigger the bigger process. But the best way to get um, referrals is, you know, if you're affiliated with a university, if you're a student, if you're an alum, reach out to consultants that are, you know, affiliated with you in some way. Um, if you don't happen to have anyone from a school that you've attended, you know, sometimes people have gone to universities um, outside of, you know, the country where you're currently working. And, and so some of that can be difficult, you know, find people in the office that you're interested in and try to get a conversation with them. Here are like the three things that I think matter. One is I want to know that you've done some advanced prep. I do not want to be your first 
kind of resource for learning about consulting. I want you to have done your homework in advance. Secondly, I want you to have a thesis about why you want to be a consultant and to not be fumbling around with that. And then third, I want you to have some targeted questions for me that are beyond like, what do you need to do to get an interview invitation? Like, I want you to ask me about the job, the work I've done, how am I growing professionally? What challenges am I facing? Like, I want you to ask me some good questions that allow us to engage as people and professionals, you know, and that's part of relationship building. What happens then is not only am I willing to be a referral for you, but I also might be willing to support you in your preparation, which could be the case interview and doing a mock case with you. So those skills are really important. And, you know, part of, part of I think, whenever I talk about consulting, the thing to remember is that this is a, it's a people business. I mean, that sounds kind of cliche, but your client skills, your ability to form relationships with your team, all of those things come through. And so when you're doing networking, you must, you know, demonstrate those skills. If you have a genuine interest in this job and you've done your base level homework, people need new people to come into consulting. And therefore, I'm eager to talk to you and I'm eager to refer you, but you have to give me evidence that it's worth my while to do that. Like if I'm gonna apply my professional capital with you, you know, you just need to make that easy for me. All right, and uh, you know, I think the last thing I would say to all of you is, you know, many, many different types of people can be great consultants. I have worked with, I have seen so many people with diverse backgrounds. It's not about your background. It's a little bit about your orientation. Do you like to fix things? Do you like to investigate things? Can you deal with lots of uncertainty? And can you take chaos and slightly organize it? Um, those, those are the kinds of things that tell you that you might have the right stuff. And then are you resourceful enough to kind of figure out how to navigate through this process, okay? Um, and, you know, as you all are navigating, um, and, and I'm picking up on one of the next questions, you know, you're, you're constantly talking about your focus on consulting. You know, as you write cover letters, as you speak to people, you know, share with them that you've done your homework, you've had a chance to speak to some of the consultants. You might talk about that in your cover letter. You might talk about it in your interview. And it really just demonstrates kind of an enthusiasm to do this job. And, and that's maybe one of my closing remarks for the case interview itself. I, I, I have, you know, some memory loss. And as I mentioned, you know, I interviewed more than 20 years ago for my first consulting job. I don't remember that it was painful. I, I may have um, somehow blocked some of those painful memories. But what I do remember is that, you know, for several months, my colleagues and I on a Sunday, we would get together on one of the campuses. Um, you know, we would actually meet up at DePaul here in Chicago because it was convenient for everybody. And for two or three hours, we would work together. And we would just challenge each other and we work through different business problems and we'd ask each other questions. And, I think there were probably 15 or so people that were pretty consistently um, coming to those sessions. Everyone did really well. And those individuals I'm still in touch with today. Most people have moved on from their consulting jobs. Most people have gone on to do really cool things professionally. But I, but I tell you all that because there was more to it 
than just the stress of preparing for consulting interviews. We were training each other for beyond the interview. We were thinking about business problems. We were helping each other. And when we got you know, into the interview setting, that was just one step in the journey to becoming a consultant. I, I think maybe this is part of that, you know, wisdom that I have at this stage. And when I work with people, I try to bring this perspective and, and you know, maybe this will be helpful for all of you. The case interview itself isn't the destination. The destination is the consulting job. And if you learn how to think about business problems and you know, solve them as part of the case interview, that's just the launch pad to doing the job. But of course you have to pass through that gate. So make it enjoyable, be excited about learning about different businesses and thinking about you know, issues analytically and you know, how to ask great questions. And that makes the case interview so much more robust. And that's the thing that's gonna help you stand out as a candidate. And that's what you care about. Okay, everyone. So for tonight, I'm gonna wrap us up in terms of our formal time together. Um, again, thank you all for joining us and listening and, and I hope you all found this valuable. Um, I will hang out for a few more minutes if anybody else has any other questions. And then, you know, as a reminder, if you are interested in um, some other insights about consulting, join us for some of the upcoming webinars. Um, if you're interested in trialing out our new case preparation software, please go to our website archercareer.com under software and um, put your name in and that you've attended the webinar um, and we'll look forward to letting you know when it's released and giving you um, an opportunity to, to trial that out as a, as a gift of ours. So thanks everybody. Have a great night.